good evening. Welcome. This is Hot Edition. We're live on Usap at Desawe Kanda, also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamil and beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. Also live all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okansi. My name is Beatrice Edu. Coming out this evening here on Hot Edition. Technicalities and the glitches, delays and frustrations characterize the start of a limited voter registration exercise, sparking concerns about the readiness of the Electoral Commission for the big day on December 7. We'll bring you uh, details of uh, that exercise. Also tonight, senior lawyer and member of Council of State, Samo Kujato, questions why Ghanaians are singling out Cecilia Dapa when there is not a single law that criminalizes stashing money in her home. He's asking those who disagree with the AG on his advice to Yoko to challenge them. Well, whose money? When somebody, mm -hmm. nobody has complained that I have stolen his money. Over a million. What did you say Foreign currency. How many Ghanaians? Look, you Ghanaians are not honest people. We'll bring you an exclusive interview. Well, talk about the question of honesty. We'll stay on this matter. He's asking the uh, those who disagree with the Attorney General on his advice to Yoko to challenge him. We have details of that shortly and some reactions as well. Also, the latest in business and sports coming up over the next one hour, 30 minutes here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. President Kufado has also been talking about uh, handing over power and, and who he thinks is going to hand over power to. That is coming up on Campaign Trail here on your election command center. Remember, we're very, very interactive on 3FM 92.7 on Facebook, also on 3FM 92.7 on X. Join us with your thoughts, views, comments, and opinions. We read out to you and to the rest of the world. Welcome. This is Hot Edition. Lord Edouard Sarri is here with a summary of the news. Lord. Thank you, Alfred. Now, the new summary is President Nana Adodanko Akufuado has told Ghanaians to vote for the flag bearer of the new patriotic party, NPP, Dr. Mahamudu Baumia, in the December 7 general elections. He says he has absolute confidence in Dr. Baumia to deliver because he has worked with him for the past seven and a half years, hence he can vouch for his competence. We also have the Bank of Ghana who has described social media reports that say it is introducing a 1% cybersecurity levy in response to heightened cybersecurity threats as fake. The central bank in a post on its social media platforms urged the general public to ignore such reports. Also, the Office of the Special Prosecutor, OSP, has rejected claims by the Attorney General that its outfit had cleared Cecilia Abnadapa of her money laundering charges. According to the OSP, it requires a thorough investigation before it would conclude that the former minister has been cleared of any charge or allegation. Again, the majority chief whip, Frank Anot Dompre, has dismissed claims by the minority that the government is plotting to hand over Ghana's gas resources to a private company. Mr. Anot Dompre described the minority's claim as dubious, hyped, and vile propaganda. That's it for the new summaries, Alfred. Lord Edouard Sari, thank you so much. This morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Hot Edition. We're live on 3FM 92.7 on Facebook. Let's get into the details of day one of the limited voter registration exercise as we have it now and network challenges and other technical glitches is what has dotted today, Beatrice. It did. And, uh, well, just... A moment we'll give you all right so network challenges and other technical glitches uh, docked the start of the limited voter registration exercise by the electoral commission the 21 day exercise which should have commenced at 7 a.m uh, across ec's district offices and hard to reach centers for most part of the morning delayed due to a number of factors including late arrival of electoral equipment challenges with network services and power outages in some parts of the country, whilst the electoral officers and potential registrants were set for the exercise, activation codes for the registration devices had not been received from the EC head offices in Accra to enable the registration to commence. These culminated in delays for several hours amid frustrations, sparking worry about the EC's readiness for the exercise. Some of the registrants spoke to us. 
right. It's not a privilege. So probably we think that at least they will set up centers at places that the people can easily get there and register as voters. When you even consider the the, the EC's office here in Paga, when you look at Kajuru, you look at Navio, you look at Nakolo, you have to travel about seven to eight or nine kilometers to get to the EC office here. And people have to, to get some kind of additional income to be able to come here. And it's something that the, the voter turnout probably or the registration turnout will be very poor because you, you know our people, they don't have money. You can come and sit then one person will just register some. The person will take like 15 minutes, 20 minutes to finish with one person before other one. So I think if there are three people there doing the registration, then it will be fine. It will help us so that we'll finish early. The EC should try as much as possible to improve on the network. I don't know where the problem has come from. Probably it might not come from. They themselves is a network, so they should try as much as possible to work on that aspect. Then they should also help the NCC to help in the advertisement so that people get to know that the process has started. This is my first time for registration, and I've been here since morning to register. And then we asked the people that are regist- doing the registration, and they said they are, their machines are having a problem, and then the network is no good. So we are still here to do, and we are still on the process to do the voting ID card. We're here early, as early as 7 a.m. this morning. Actually, the EC setup was not even ready. So we waited for them to come. Everything was set around 9 a.m. But in less than an hour, we told that the system has gone down. So as at now that we are speaking, you can see the stress that we are all facing here. Trying to convince someone to come and register. Because due to some challenges, people are thinking that the voter side guys of no use to them. Aside voting. Aside voting. So for now, you go and convince the person. We, the political party, are the ones benefiting. At least, uh, let me say, we are the ones that are in need of these voters. That's how they see it. From the way things are going. So you go and convince someone to come and register. The voters are can, and he will come. He or she will come, and the system will be off for an hour. The person has left his work or her work to come and review. So definitely, the person can do it. The person will do it. So the stress in it is that is what we are all facing. Just as you are witnessing. The system has been down for less than an hour. So that is started going on. So there's nothing is going on. The only thing that they are telling us is the system is down. And so you heard some voters. They were actually from the Upper East region. We can hear some more uh, from some other centers. We're here early, as early as 7 a.m. this morning. And actually, the EC setup was not even ready. So we waited for them to come. Everything was set around 9 a.m. But in less than an hour, we told that the system has gone down. So as at now that we are speaking, you can see the stress that we are all facing here. Trying to convince someone to come and register. Because due to some challenges, people are thinking that the voter side is of no use to them. Aside voting. Aside voting. So for now, you go and convince the person. We, the political party, are the ones benefiting. At least, uh, let me say, we are the ones that are in need of these voters. That's how they see it. So uh, we'll bring you some more reactions uh, from our analysts, but we can hear more from uh, some senior executives of the NDC and the MPP. Let's start off from the NDC. Uh, Malik Basintale is Deputy Communications Officer, uh, sharing his views about the exercise today. We are not surprised. We are not surprised at the conduct of the electoral commission. We are not surprised at the turnout of, of, of turnout of events. We are not surprised as to some of these challenges because we hinted, we told the entire country the Electoral Commission was not ready for this upcoming registration exercise. We made everyone aware, we made you media men aware that Jen Mensa and Hen Taraj were only interested in responding to President Mahama anytime he spoke. They were interested in monitoring the campaign of President Mahama and they failed clearly check and put all systems in place. They failed to align with their required mandate in ensuring that especially, I mean, people who attend 18 were, were registered on to uh, uh, register. Today, the turn of our events have proven that the NDC was right. And you heard uh, Mali Basintale, he's Deputy Communications Officer for the NDC, Director of Elections and Research for the Governing New Patriotic Party, Evans Nimakon. Is he calling not happy? What is happening is, is not too good. That the monitoring team shows that the EEC has been having uh, challenges for the 
IT system, activity, code has not been saved, and all that. So, uh, we expect the EC to do the needful. Yes, I mean, expecting the needful from the EC just means that they must work their talk. Uh, we have 21 day registration exercise. Today is day one. It is expected that all those who are, are, are of age, uh, qualify under the Constitution, must be given the opportunity to, to register. It, it cannot be welcome that they will go to the education center or not have the opportunity to work. Any kind of loss is, is so expensive. We can afford that. The EEC must come clear to us and let us know what is really happening. I mean, as I said, we, we can welcome the situation where people have moved from their homes to registration centers only to be treated in this manner. And you heard that uh, Evans Nimako, he uh, is the Director of Elections and Research for the governing New Patriotic Party. Well, let, let's stay a bit further on some of the reactions that we're getting because as you have indicated, Beatrice, it appears that both the NPP and the NDC are not too happy with the Electoral Commission on day one of this limited voter registration exercise. It's 21 days, but definitely they were expecting that with the level of preparation according to the electoral commission that they have had to put in place for this exercise it would have witnessed a smooth takeoff today but that did not happen let's go on to the telephone now christopher marco is our northern and savannah regional correspondent he's been monitoring day one and the northern region is joining us on the telephone chris now what, what can you tell us with the various centers that you visited uh, with the events of issues relating to technical challenges and then also we understand some dooms also affected some areas yes alfred exactly so because um uh, around eight to uh, 11 a.m., uh, there was power outage in the Kamale area. And so the two uh, uh, um, uh, registration centers, that is to say the Sarnalgo uh, District EC office and the Kamale Metro EC office could not uh, start the uh, 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 registration exercise on time. Also, uh, there were uh, issues of network uh, challenges and so the entire process was frustrated. Even though most of the applicants uh, arrived at their registration centers as early as uh, 4 and 5 a.m. to be part of the exercise. So um, the one hasn't been good here in uh, uh, Tamale Metropolis as we speak uh, as, as part of the uh, closing time and with Sagnargo only 17 uh, uh, of the uh, applicants comprising uh, Tamale, North, and Sarnago constituencies fair registered as at 4.30 p.m. I see. And uh, how about the political parties as well? You've been talking to them. What's been their reaction on day one so far? Yes, so they are disappointed because uh, for the NBC and other uh, uh, minority political parties, they are saying that look, they have engaged the EC on uh, this matter and also uh, uh, talking to the EC to ensure that uh, uh, this exercise does not suffer the challenges that it suffered during uh, the immediate uh, uh, past registration exercise that we saw uh, before the district level elections. And so uh, if they are seeing uh, this repeat itself, it means that the EC is not serious about this year's election, which uh, is seen as a crucial uh, election for the future of the country. And so they are disappointed. Uh, even the NPP uh, agents have also shared their disappointment uh, on this particular matter. Now, we understand that uh, as even though the registration exercise was advertised to start at 7 a.m., a number of the centers did not start at 7 a.m., at least in the other regions. Did you witness the same in the northern region as well? Yes, uh, the first card in uh, Tamale for the two uh, 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 registration centers was printed over after 12 uh, noon. If you go to other districts as well, that was the same uh, situation. That 12 o'clock. So, I mean, 12, yes, 12, 12, 12 midday. 12, 12 midday. 12 midday. They, they had not started registration? Yes, they had not printed or no a single person had successfully gone through the process. The first at Sarnarugu was printed after 12 uh, midday and same as the uh, 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 the Tamale Metro Registration Center. Chris, I appreciate you for this. Thank you so much.
Christopher Marco is our Northern and Savannah Regional Correspondent. And it appears that that story of uh, the registration of starting as advertised at 7 a.m. runs through a number of the regions we have visited so far. And then also the technical issues. Doomso as well, we understand, affected the start of some of the areas of registration process. The, the lights went off and that affected the, the registration process starting as well. And we want to find out how, what happened in the Ashanti region because that's another place to watch. Ibrahim Abubakar was on the ground today on day one. He's joining us on the telephone. Ibrahim, thank you so much for joining us. Now, would you sing the same chorus as the other regions are singing that, that due to Dumsa, for instance, and then also some technical issues that led to the delay of the registration starting at some of the centers? Well, Fred, for Ashanti region, um, there has not been any center that I visited, and the, the delay has to do with them. So, but uh, with regards to the technical challenge, um, it appears it cuts across the country, and Ashanti region was not exempted. So, people were there on time, a number of the students got there on time, and at like seven, eight, they were still having challenge with their machine, especially the printing machine. So what some of the centers decided to do was to allow the applicants go through the process. Then when it gets to the printing side, they have to step aside and wait until it comes. So it was around 12.40 that they were able to rectify the machines and started issuing ID cards. But throughout from morning, uh, the students or the new applicants had to stand under the scorching sign, uh, hoping that the challenges will be resolved soon for them to also be able to get the ID card so that December 7, they will be part of the decision-making process. In fact, for most of them, even though they were frustrated with the process, uh, some of them were sweating, but they were still there. They, they were not ready to, to leave because the excitement of um, having a voter ID card for the first time and being able to be part of the people who will choose the next president of Ghana and also um, be part of selecting their representative members of parliament or something that uh, encourages them to um, stand there and make sure that they get their voter ID card before they leave. So uh, frustration, but uh, they were excited, especially when at the last minute some of them started um, getting their ID card. I see. And about, about the political parties as well, the, uh, the the observers who were there, what have they been saying? Well, a lot of number of them were there. In fact, uh, some of them had to blame the EC and even ended up saying the EC has been incompetent over the years because this is something you should have planned for. Test all the machines, make sure that everything is intact, everything is functional before the exercise will start. Yet, we stand, and these are not isolated cases. For, for us to have general um, or the same concern cutting across the country, it's something they believe the ex, uh, EC has not done um, its part well. In fact, the Ashanti Regional Minister, who is also the chairman of Brexit, was also worried because for him, the, the more we have these kind of delays or these kind of challenges, the more some of the centers are open up for um, some violent activity because we see the political parties or political party representatives coming there, some of them uh, shouting on top of their voices and other things. So he was also hoping to see that the issue be resolved soon so that um, at the end of the day, we will have an incident-free an incident election. Okay. Right, right. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ibrahim Abubakar. It's a Ashanti Regional Correspondent giving us updates on the observation on day one here on your election command centre. The limited registration exercise being conducted by the Electoral Commission. And with all of these challenges that led to the start, the delay in the start of the registration exercise in a number of the centres across the country, uh, both persons, prospective voters and the observers, officials of the various political parties who are the various centres observing this process are not too happy about this. But this is what the Electoral Commission said prior to the start of the vote, limited voter agenda exercise today. The chair of the Electoral Commission was confident about this process starting smoothly.
we have successfully recruited returning officers and deputy returning officers for each of our 268 district offices nationwide. For the first time in our history, we have created a database of these officers and we can now identify them by their names, photographs, Ghana cards and voter ID cards, as well as residential addresses. Hitherto, they existed on paper. They were names on paper. Today, we are able to match a person's name and, uh, to his photograph and ID card and so on. I'm happy to note that all persons recruited have no less than eight years working experience with the commission. The commission will make and has always made available the names and photographs of its returning officers and deputy returning officers to the political parties. And any party can object to the name of a selected returning officer or deputy returning officer. It is our desire to continue to operate a transparent and open door policy in all our dealings. The registration will be for 21 days and it will include Saturdays and Sundays. All our district offices will have fixed teams ranging from two to three teams depending on the size of the district and the expectation of the number of registered voters to come through. The mobile teams, as the name connotes, will move around from one electoral area to the next electoral area. They will spend two days in each electoral area. The mobile teams assigned to the 25 public universities will, however, spend three days in each public university. So that's the chair of the Electoral Commission, Jenna Doko Emensa, that detailing the preparation that the Electoral Commission have put in place ahead of today. But it appears that all did not go as planned for the Electoral Commission because of the numerous reports of technical issues, uh, <laughs> doom saw, you know, and others, Beatrice, that led to the delay in the start of the registration process at, mm. at a number of these centers that we've visited across the country so far. But there's a statement from the Electoral Commission. DC has some explanation for what happened today. It says in that statement, which was issued uh, just about some minutes ago, the Commission wishes to bring to the attention of the general public that following our monitoring of the voters' registration exercise this morning, we observed some technical challenges with internet connectivity in a number of our centers. This delayed the start of the registration at a number of the registration centers. We are happy to note that by 12 p.m., the technical issues in most of the registration centers had been resolved. Consequently, the registration exercise is proceeding smoothly in almost all the registration centers nationwide. The Commission will continue to monitor the registration exercise and promptly address any issues that may arise. Uh, we encourage all qualified applicants to avail themselves and register to vote in their respective districts. Election 2024, your vote. Your future signed by Michael Wardu, Acting Director, Public Affairs. So they are saying by 12 p.m., the technical issues were resolved. After 12 p.m., we actually spoke to our correspondents, particularly in the Ayawasu Wagon Central Kuole Klote, who had monitored these, uh, those areas and said that as of that time, nothing had, had been corrected. Mm -hmm. People were still in queues and not a single person had been registered. And it appears uh, that that's consistent, not just with these areas you mentioned. In the northern region, we just spoke to Christopher Marco, a northern regional correspondent who had indicated that uh, as at 1 p.m., in some of the areas like um, Sagnerugu and, and others, uh, the registration had not started. So, well, the Electoral Commission, obviously, beyond this statement they've issued, have a lot more questions to, to answer, at least to the persons who have been raising them. Mustafa Bande is Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. He's joining us on the telephone for a conversation on this. Mustafa, I appreciate your time. Good evening to you. Good evening, Alfred. Now, this is the, the explanation from the Electoral Commission that uh, some technical issues that largely led to the delay in the registration process starting in most parts of the country today. And as of 12 noon, they had rectified the situation. You have people on the ground. Is it consistent with what the reports you've received? Thank you very much, Alfred. Um, basically, let me start to say that today is the one 
of the registration exercise. We have pressure all over the place. Um, since morning, there have been issues of network, late uh, provision of activation codes to the various registration centers across the country. Uh, even before we commenced the registration, the network was not coming on. Now that they have provided the activation codes and the network comes on and off, we have places where the machines are not even functioning. Printers cannot work and all of that. Uh, we have places where we have permanent breakdown of network. We have areas where network challenges, uh, uh, electricity challenges, contrary to the assurance of the Electoral Commission that it will uh, provide a standby generator for the purposes of areas where light may go off so that we can rely on the standby generator for the registration. They have not done so and have not provided any explanation as to why, as we speak today, uh, those standby generators have not been been, been provided for. Uh, after day one of any nationwide exercise, one would expect some of these challenges, uh, but we should be dealing with a very honest electoral commission that will appreciate the issues as to how they are. But these window dressing of telling lies to the public, whereas the reality is different, is mind-boggling that until up to today, even media houses who are the fourth estate can attest to the fact that the statement the EC put out is not just bogus. It does not reflect the situation on the ground. It does not seem to be coming from a serious organization that want to be professional. Let's, you know, to talk of a commission that is foreseeing a national election to be telling lies. I mean, it's a cause of worry. Alfred, the situation is not resolved. It is still the same. What are they talking about? Is it not the same commissioner that did a press conference assuring the public that it has made arrangements for standby generators? Where are those generators? Is she lying to the people who are being victimized today? Students would have to leave school even since morning. They have not eaten, and they are still in line, only for the recklessness of the Electoral Commission. Today, people who have left their businesses are still in queues. They have not been able to register. As you know, Besides the fact that we have had to contend with economic hardship from the Danado government, this is what we are subjecting them to. Must young people be frustrated this way only because they have to fulfill their constitutional mandate. I said it's worrying. What they have said, the statement they have put out is blatant falsehood. It does not reflect the reality on the ground. It's a lie, and it just reflects that we have individuals sitting at the commission, at the headquarters, who do not have intelligence on the ground. We know what is happening on the ground, and we hope that the commission will sit up seriously, get reports from their various directors, and media houses have captured most of their directors who are complaining about these same situations. So what are they talking about? Mr. Bande, uh, Beatrice here. I know this afternoon we spoke and you told me that uh, you were uh, monitoring the situation, picking information from your reps in various constituencies. I want you to hold on. Uh, we have a member of the Council of State, Samokujeto, lawyer Samokujeto, who is confirming to us that the EC met them last week uh, to give some information uh, to the members. I want you to listen to him and we'll come back uh, to our conversation. Okay. We had, uh, had actually had an interview with them last week. The Council of State has a, a whole meeting with them to, for them to expand and explain the logistics and all the other things that they're doing or they have planned to do. And as you are aware, they are starting the uh, updating of the voter register from today. 
Yes. And uh, that is the most important thing that those who are eligible to vote can vote. And they're working on that. Even to the extent of saying that even uh, after that that date is closed, those who are eligible will still have an opportunity to register at least at a few days before the actual election. So that, that's all that democracy requires, that those who are entitled to vote should be able to decide. And you're impressed with the level of preparedness the Electoral Commission shared with you ahead of today? Oh, yes. It's, inter it's interesting you say that the EC met you last week. That's it. Because yesterday, both MPP and NDC told us that they were supposed to have received the list of those who are going to be working with the Electoral Commission for this exercise, and the EC did not provide that. And they were even accusing the EC of not being transparent. EC found it necessary to talk to the Council of State, but one of the primary stakeholders as did not seem to have information. Let's just get it clear. The council invited them to know what they are doing to ensure that that is a good election. It gives us the impression that they are meeting all the various stakeholders, including even the parties who formerly had refused to join that group, who have now agreed to join the group. And so the question is that there is so much suspicion in our country, which is so dangerous, in the sense that things that people can sit down and talk about, they won't do it, they go on air, to go and uh, blacken the other side. They think that's the best way to get their concerns heard? No, it is not the democratic process. Democratic process means dialogue, and dialogue means continuous conversation. That's what it is. It's not accusations. I think Ghanaians just love accusation, and I don't think that that is healthy. That is not the healthy democracy. The media exists exactly for the same purpose. It means when you hear something, you don't go and blah blah it in the paper. You go to the person concerned. So one of the parties in particular, uh, the NDC, um, a number of the time when it comes on uh, the radio on television and accuses the Electoral Commission. It says that, well, EC didn't raise these things at uh, I Park and spring in surprise on us like yesterday when they mentioned that they were not even given the list and EC said, well, you can contest it. And that's just like less than 24 hours ahead of the exercise. All I'm saying is that if you have that group which is meant to be able to discuss issues and you are grieved by something, Get the groups to meet. You have every right to say, let's meet you, or let's meet some responsible official. So that was uh, Samokuja Tova. He is a member of the Council of State. Uh, and uh, Mustafa Bande, you just heard them there. I'll ask you two questions in one. Number one, he seems to give the impression that indeed the EC might have been prepared ahead of today's exercise. And the second issue is he raised about people, just uh, political parties in particular, uh, speaking on the radio when they could address their issues with the EC directly. Let me, let me note that first and foremost, Mr. Samukujato, lawyer, a respected elder. It's not a statesman. He is an elder of the MPP. The same old men who are in a league with old President Akufado to run down this country. He is not in any position to now the pontification. We should take him a new trial. Is it not the same Council of State that sat together, supervised the appointment of a politically exposed person onto the commission? Ghanaians, people who are in queues, are complaining, you know, manifested technical and operational challenges and assurances of the electoral commission that is not being seen on the ground. And you are sitting in a class, an old man, and saying that there is suspicion in this country. The widespread corruption in the government that he sits on. And if he, do you take this kind of uh, person serious? Can they protect the younger generation when they have put their stomachs and their interests first than the nation? It should spare us a letter, deal with the reality on the ground. The commission is paid by taxpayers' money, 
And we will hold the commission responsible to give the people of this country nothing but transparent election. We will not allow this group of old men to hold the generation to ransom. At this time, if some Okujato cannot see that things are not well, then I am sorry he's not living up to expectation of his age. He what, should pay us. What does the NDC <laughs> intend to do to ensure that uh, you're helping, as it were, the Electoral Commission in organizing a very smooth exercise? Mind you, the EC says That's even it. after the 21 days, there would be an opportunity for those who couldn't participate to do so. That is why... We believe that today is day one of the exercise. And so what we continue to do is to encourage young people who are in the queues already, who are depressed with the level of hardship that President Akufado has exposed them to, the level of hopelessness that this government has exposed them to, people who have had to leave their jobs to sit in queues without being registered, we've been begging them the whole day, working with the other side divide, so that these people can still be interested in the registration. And so that is our contribution, to be patient with the Electoral Commission, hoping that a commission will rectify the challenges on the ground, operationally and technically, so that we have a smooth process. But not for these old men to come and be validating things that are not real. It's unfortunate that we have old men who do not see wrong, old men who do not see corruption, old men who do not see that President Akufado is collapsing this country. And yet they want to think that they should speak on behalf of a younger generation. They should spare us. We'll have to end it here. Uh, uh, hopefully we are able to uh, get the MPP joining us to give us uh, their responses as well. But thank you very much, uh, Mustafa Gbande, Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, for speaking to us. It's live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7, also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and Beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and Beyond. We are also encouraging you to share experiences with us. If you did go to any of the registration centres, Facebook page 3FM 92.7, on Facebook, also on X at 3FM927, and we will share it with the rest of the world. A number of you, Nanayao says, good afternoon, Alfred. And Beatrice, I visited a center in Kaswa in the central region, and I was there till 1 p.m. before the registration started. Nanaya also says that I want to understand this. Was the registration exercise expected to start at 7 a.m. as you stated? Yes, indeed. That's what the Electoral Commission um, did, did advertise in uh, the announcement ahead of the start of the limited voter registration exercise today but as we've witnessed a number of areas we don't, we don't have that but as we do know now as well the system that's just coming through from the coalition of domestic election Ob observers they have prepared 195 observers for the biometric voter registration exercise by the electoral commission that began today these observers who will be stationed in 146 randomly selected districts have been trained for the event and that is set to begin today and concluded on the 27th of may the team of observers includes 25 regional coordinators 87 stationary observers and 86 mobile observers Albert Kofiahin, who is the national coordinator of the Coalition for Domestic Election Observers, Kudeo, in a statement signed earlier today, explained that all 195 observers received training before their deployment to ensure professional conduct at the registration centers and the delivery of quality reports to Kudeo's data center throughout the registration period. So that's what's happening right now with respect to Kodeo. Let's bring you some more because lecturers in 46 colleges of education have threatened to go on strike by May 31. The Colleges of Education Association of Ghana, CTAC, is demanding that the government pays uh, their one-month additional allowance and implement their conditions of service. Let's remind you of what's happened so far. Remember that in August 2023, CTAC members from all the 46 training colleges went on strike citing the government's failure to adhere to the National Labour Commission's arbitral award orders and the negotiated conditions of service since May 2, 2023. Now, the industrial action brought academic activities across all campuses to a halt, compelling the NLC to proceed to court 
for an order to compel the teachers to call off the strike. The commission subsequently directed the government to honor the terms in line with the arbitral award. Now, despite repeated notices sent to the Ministry of Finance, the agreed upon negotiations are yet to be implemented, leading to the continued impasse. Now, we shall engage the leadership of uh, CTAC shortly, but first, uh, take a listen to the CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Engineer Ben Arthur, who's promising that implementation will begin before the 31st of May. He spoke to our Labour Affairs correspondent, Daniel Opoku. I can only appeal to them to be patient because steps are far advanced to ensure that they are paid. So there are a lot of, you know, uh, steps have been taken. The last one being the submission of those who are beneficiaries. And GTEC is in the process of sending it to the appropriate quarters for, for payment to be made. So they have waited enough, I can understand. They should wait a little bit more, and I'm sure the money will be given to them. Oh, so you are confident they will be paid before the 31st? Oh, oh yes, because we had a meeting just last week hmm. on this matter, and we were very optimistic. All the institutions involved, Fair Wages and Ghana Tertiary Educational Commission, we all agreed to take the necessary steps. So we've taken uh, custody of those who are beneficiaries, mm. and we know the amount that has to be paid. That was outstanding in those days, but the data has been given. Mm. And I'm sure if you speak to GTEC, they also confirm this. So we can only appeal to them to be patient. There's another issue that has to do with an implementation of audit report, which is still under the ambit of uh, GTEC. But what is happening is that there are certain steps to take before you can really implement. It's just like you can't simply buy a football, buy Jesse, uh, gather some people and say that you have no playgrounds. You definitely must have a playground for these uh, teams to be able to play together. So. Government agrees totally with the ruling of National Labor Commission to implement the audit report. However, there is a need for a scheme of service. There is a need for us to be able to identify all those who may have to be reclassified, and that has already been done. And you heard there, uh, Ben Arthur, he is the executive, uh, the CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. In British, let's say a bit further on this. If that call to be patient would, would receive any favorable responses. Prince Ben Himan leads the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CTAG. He's joining us on the telephone. So, Ben Himan, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Hot Edition. Alfred, good evening and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Good evening to your cherished listeners and the uh, platform of teachers in the College of Education across the Portuguese Public College of Education. I must say that the National Labor Commission gave clear and unambiguous orders. And when orders are given, uh, it behoves on the parties that appear before the National Labor Commission to comply. If for one reason or the other, a party has a reason for which it will not be able to adequately comply. You go back to the National Labor Commission by way of an appeal or by way of uh, an explanation. So the commission will come out with another interpretation. But you don't sit, and then because you are government and uh, you have the power, you seek to interpret it the way you want. For us in CITAC, clear on a, on a big deal, uh, what a few were given on the 2nd of May that uh, implements the arbitral orders. And the arbitral orders included, I mean, a lot of things which are yet to be implemented. One, payment for the one month salary he the, 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 the engineer talked about, engineer Benata talked about, it's yet to be, uh, you know, done for having worked throughout the year. The fair wages uh, was also supposed to have uh, refereed so that the ongoing staff audit will be completed before, on or before 31st, July 2023. There was also an order that the agreed rate payable to public universities shall be applied to the seven members of CETAC. And then an order for the implementation of the completed uh, staff for this exercise, which is supposed to retrospectively uh, you know, take effect from 1st January 2023. 
And you look at all these things, it's not been done. It's, there, there's nowhere that we talk about, uh, I mean, all the things that they are talking about, shifting goals and all that they have to, scheme of service and what have you, all these things are not mentioned. Those are their interpretations. So that's why we are saying that we did a press conference a couple of weeks ago. This is a reminder. So we are simply saying that if by 31st May, all these things are not implemented, we we'll advise ourselves. So what even what what even makes us unhappy is the fact that when we went on strike the other time, salary freeze has been used as a tool of punishment and threat. We went on strike, legal strike, before the National Labor Commission could even declare the strike illegal. Government decided to freeze salaries. At the end of everything, we did what we were supposed to have done by way of work. They said, pay the members. And you decide to look at some of us, our faces, because we are the front runners. As we speak now, my good self, Prince of Inhima, the national president of CITAC, my August last year's salary continues to be frozen without any justifiable cause, alongside other members who supported the cause of the strike action. And you think we are not Ghanaian? We shouldn't talk about this? So we are saying that all these things should be done by 31st July, out of which we advise ourselves in a manner that resonates with our economic emancipation and survival in the face of the economic crunch that we all find ourselves in, in the nation. Your ultimatum is, this is bitches, your ultimatum is the 31st of this month. And the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission is giving yet another assurance that before that time, uh, whatever it is you're asking for, we would have uh, at least uh, been in a positive uh, direction. You're saying, based on your explanation, you're taking this with a pinch of salt. You don't believe the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission? You know, he emphasizes so much on the payment of the compensation. As if when you pay the compensation, that is uh, all. The compensation is just one, and we are asking for total and holistic implementation of the arbitral orders, which the compensation is just one. So even if the salary is paid and the rest of the items, including paying, uh, I mean, the other things, implementing the whole thing, if it's not done, I think we'll still advise ourselves. Again, I'm sure you remember that the NLC ruled that there should be an audit report. Uh, wouldn't you take the other side of the argument that that could be delaying this whole process? The NLC said there should be an audit report, and we appeared before the NLC when the audit report was still in progress. And the NLC did not give that in vacuum. They gave timeline. They said it should be implemented. Uh, I mean, they should finish on or before 31st August. Uh, uh, sorry, on or before 31st July 2023. And then I think came out with a ruling, having listened to the submissions of the, I mean, the government side and all the people who were involved in the staff audit. At that point, they did not indicate, did not give any indication that it would go beyond the timeline that had been given by the NLC. So as far as we are concerned, they have simply flouted the orders of the NLC. I see. So that called for you to be patient. Uh, it's not one that you're going to heed to. You, you, it's not going to be accepted, correct? Patients when people who ought to have uh, benefited from this before retiring. Patients when people who ought to have benefited from this before dying. We keep attending funerals of people who have served the nation, who have served teacher education, who have contributed immensely to the transformation of teacher education in the country and never benefited, are retiring, are dying. I think that Patience is too moralistic, and that's not what we have to look at. I see. So if if this is not going to be accepted, what's going to be the next step for you? What would you do, CITAC? We are saying that if by 31st, if by 31st July, the arbitral awards are not fully implemented, we we'll advise ourselves in a manner that will give us once and for all economic freedom and then justice in the country. And that will be fully determined, or that will be fully defined when we get there. I see. All right, we'll see. He says by May 31, you will be paid. So this this uh, decision or the action of uh, maybe re withdrawing your services is not going to happen. The that payment is just one out of the lot. So you pay, you don't create impression to the whole world that the all-year compensation is it that we are crying for. We are saying that, holistically implement what the arbitral orders are 
which the payment you talk about is just one out of the things we talk about. Thank you very much, uh, Prince Obin Hima. He is the president of CTAC. Thank you for speaking to us. You're still here on Hot Edition. My name is Beatrice Edu. I'm doing this with... My name is Alfred Oconsi. And it's time for business. Mm -hmm. Bismarck Wusa is here to bring us the latest. Stay with us. I just want to tell my mom that I love her. You know, she's been a great mom. Sunday, the 12th of May, is the day set aside to celebrate Mother's Day. TV3 and 3FM 92.7 gives you the chance to make it memorable for Mama with the exclusive event Dining with Mama at the plush Tomrick Hotel, East Legon, from 1 p.m. Time to celebrate your incredible mothers and mother figures. Win great prizes while enjoying delicious food and drinks, live band music, artiste performances, and games. Join us at Dining with Mama on Sunday, May 12th at 1 p.m. Rate is single 350 Ghana cities and double 600 Ghana cities. Tickets are available at the front desk of TV3 and Tomrick Hotel, East Legon. For reservations, please call 0532-200-927 or 0532-300-927. TV3 and 3FM wishes all mothers a happy Mother's Day. Mama, God bless you. Vendors, calling all parents, guardians, mothers and fathers, expecting mothers and fathers, the 3FM Baby Fair is back. 92.7 3FM presents the 3FM Baby Fair 2024. A one-stop shop for childcare products, clothes, toys and child development products for all kids of all ages. For three exciting days on Friday the 24th of May to Sunday the 26th of May at the Marina Mall Airport City Accra. Are you a vendor or dealer in children products or services, children educational material or anything related to children of all ages? Then you need to be at the 92.7 3FM Baby Fair. To be a part of the fair and exhibit your products and services, please call 0531-100-927 and 0532-200-927 right now. Parents, make it a family affair at the 3FM Baby Fair with a fun photo booth for family shoots, kids arena for the kids to have fun, and so much excitement. 3FM Baby Fair on the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th of May at Marina Mall Airport City, Accra. 3FM Baby Fair is powered by 3FM and proudly supported by TV3, 3FM 92.7, your urban lifestyle radio. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the business segment on Hot Edition with me, Bismarck. I was coming up. Bank of Ghana denies rumors of proposed cybersecurity levy on banking transactions. We'll bring you details. Well, company, now to our very first story. In a bid to address recent cybersecurity concerns, Rumors circulated about the Bank of Ghana's plan to implement a 1% cybersecurity levy on all banking transactions. However, the central bank has swiftly refuted these claims, urging the public to disregard this information. The Bank of Ghana has squashed rumors regarding the purported implementation of a 1% cybersecurity levy on banking transactions. Following heightened cybersecurity threats locally and globally, Speculations arose about the bank's intention to levy a fee aimed at bolstering cyber defenses in the financial sector. However, the Bank of Ghana swiftly addressed the misinformation, clarifying that no such levy is being considered or planned. In a statement released earlier today, the bank emphasized the importance of accurate information dissemination and urged the public to remain vigilant against fake news. The clarification comes amidst growing concerns over cybersecurity vulnerabilities in the financial industry, particularly in the wake of recent cyber attacks targeting banks and other financial institutions globally. While cybersecurity remains a top priority for regulatory bodies and financial institutions alike, the Bank of Ghana reiterated its commitment to exploring effective strategies to enhance cybersecurity measures without imposing additional financial burdens on consumers. 
And that was a three business news desk report on Bank of Ghana denying rumors of proposed cybersecurity levy on banking transactions. Moving on, Locked Up Investment Holders Forum, a group of individuals unable to access their investments in insolvent finance houses and savings and loans companies, is launching a picketing campaign at the Ministry of Finance on Wednesday, May 15, 2024. This follows a public protest on March 27 and a petition submitted to the Ministry of Finance on March 28, which, according to the group, the Finance Ministry has ignored. Dr. Eduanani Entry is convener of the group. And the letters personally there. I sent letters personally and delivered the letters to the office of the minister. For three weeks, no acknowledgement was even received, nothing. So after three weeks, we sent a reminder to the ministry. We heard nothing. And even as we speak now, we haven't heard anything. It's not a right thing to, to even hear that uh, you have written a letter and nobody seems to even care that you, 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 you even, the, uh, you, you, you must be, even the acknowledged, the letter must be acknowledged. So uh, this week, Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, which is 15th of May, we will start the picketing at the Ministry of Finance. And we will continue to do that every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, we will be there until a solution is found to this problem. And that was convener of the Locked Up Investment Holders Forum, Dr. Edu Anani Entry. Before we go, in the wake of multinational corporations exiting the country, the Association of Ghana Industry, AGI, highlights an even graver situation facing local businesses. According to the association, indigenous enterprises are shutting down daily due to unfavorable economic conditions. We will bring you details of this story in our subsequent bulletins. And that will be all for the business segment on Hot Edition with me, Bismarck. I will start for more business stories. Please log on to 3news.com. Thanks for your company. Sports is next. the country and even beyond. They are coming to take their place at the table. Hello and welcome to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Bill Ishen. Let's start off from the local scene where the Legon Stadium, which was completed earlier this year, has been used for some important events. It is set to become the venue of one of Ghana's biggest competitions. There's more in this report. The University of Ghana Stadium looks like the new location for high-profile matches. It is set to host the final of the 2024 MTN FA Cup, a cup competition that has run for over six decades. The construction of the facility began in 2004 and after major delays, it was completed earlier this year, just in time for the 2023 African Games in March. Fans filled a 10,000 capacity venue that month to witness the opening ceremony, closing ceremony, and cheered Rose Yabua, Kadman Yamua, and Ghana's 4 by 100 meters relay teams to medal victories. In mid-May, the Wafu Under-17 Zombie Championships are expected to be held there. The competition, featuring seven countries, will serve as a qualifier for the Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations. In a few months, we could see Black Stars players score goals on the Ligon Stadium pitch. We have an international standard venue on our hands. Now, as was mentioned earlier, the University of Ghana Stadium will host the Under-17 Wafu Zumbi Championship and the schedule for the competition has been announced by the Wafu Zumbi Secretariat. The tournament will commence with the host nation, Ghana, taking on Cote d'Ivoire on Wednesday, May 15th, 2024 at the University of Ghana uh, Stadium in Accra. Defending champions Nigeria are set to battle Burkina Faso on Thursday, May 16th, while Togo will clash with Niger on match day two. 
Of course, as I mentioned earlier, it will take place at the Legon Stadium from May 15 to May 29th, 2024. Moving on to Ghanaian uh, footballers abroad, Abdul Fatah Ishaaku has already booked a place in the Premier League next season with Leicester City, but others are also close to making the top leagues in the world. Oreku Ampofo has more details on these players who are making strides in their various leagues. After being relegated on the final day last season, Gideon Mensah and Elisha Owusu will be back in League A with Oxair next season. With two games to go, Oxair is top of League Day, six points clear and a goal difference swing of 15 in their favour. It will be an immediate return to the top flight for Mensah and Owusu, who stayed to help the one-time League A champions return to the top flight. Fatah Isaku joined Leicester City on loan after they had been relegated from the Premier League last season. The 20-year-old played a crucial role in the Foxes' promotion charge, scoring six goals and providing 13 assists. Ishaku is expected to be included in Leicester City's Premier League squad, with the club set to pay the 17 million euro obligation fee. Kamal Dean Suleimana will also have a chance to return to the Premier League as Southampton prepares for the Championship playoffs. Felix Afenejan and Kimonese are also eyeing an immediate return to the Serie A, but they will need to maneuver their way through the Serie B playoffs. Ransford Yebu Akonik's Dolphins' way to play in the top flight continues as Hamburg will need a miracle to make it to the Bundesliga next season. The Red Shorts must overcome a four-point deficit in their last two games to make the playoffs. That was a report there by Reku and Puffo on the Ghanaians making strides in their various leagues. Now, it's the Champions League night. Dortmund are seeking a place in the final of the competition for the first time since 2013 as they face PSG tonight. They currently lead by one goal to nil on aggregate. Dortmund coach Edin Terzic spoke ahead of the game. Well, very difficult question um, because I think you need to, to separate it. Um, if, you, if you see now the recent results that you just mentioned, you're totally right. But I think we are the team in, in, in the Bundesliga, for example, that um, only collected the fewest points against the top five teams in the Bundesliga. But in the Champions League, we did a fantastic job so far. Um, yeah, we know that we are ready. Um, to win games. This is something that we showed this season. It doesn't matter at home or away from home. The only thing that we didn't show this season is that we are ready to win every game. And this is the reason why we are struggling in the Bundesliga, but also the reason why we are sitting here and, and, and talking in front of a semi-final. That was Borussia Dortmund's coach Edin Terzic. Now let's look at the lineups for both teams for the second leg of the UEFA Champions League semi-finals. For Borussia Dortmund, Kobol is in goal. In defense, we have Martin, Schlotterberg, Homos, and Ryerson. In midfield, they have Sabitzer, Emre Chan, Adeyemi, Bront, and Jaden Sancho. In attack, they have Fulcrook, who scored the first goal for Dortmund in the first leg, and they won by one goal to know. Of course, this is PSG's lineup as well. Donnarumma is in goal. In defense, we have Ashraf Hakimi, Marquinhos, uh, Beraldo, and Nuno Mendes. In midfield, we have Zaire Emery, Vitinha, and Fabian Ruiz. And in attack, they have Kylian Mbappe, uh, Gonzalo Ramos, and Usman Dembele. Here are the lineups. Four both teams ahead of the semi final clash. We'll start at 7 p.m. tonight. To our final story, Paul Pogba has made a career switch with a midfielder set to appear in his first feature film. The film titled Four Zeros is a sequel to 2002's film Three Zeros set for release in April 2025. He reportedly play the role of a youth, youth team football coach. Pogba has won many titles in his career, including the FIFA World Cup in 2018, where he scored in the final. The Juventus star is currently serving a four-year ban after testing positive for a banned substance. That brings an end to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Billy Shen, and of course, Beaches and Alfred are standing by.
they should go and challenge it. A lawyer has actually threatened to sue. Oh, my dear. Look, the lawyer, the fact is full of so many people. There are hot heads who don't even understand the law. They will not even take the trouble to discuss with their colleagues to find out what it is. And then they join the make publicity and then you, the press, carry it. That is what the problem is. You think the AGE had to advise? No, I am just telling you that when you start telling me a lawyer, that's what I'm trying to correct you and say that the law is still of so many people. How many so many people ran into the Supreme Court and they were thrown out? They are lawyers. But the question is that law is not mathematics where you just add one and two and you say that, uh, you know, this is the result. Law is a complex subject. So that was Samoku Jeto. Uh, they're giving his opinion on the Cecilia Dapa case uh, with Yoko OSP, Attorney General, coming in. We're going to bring you uh, that full interview, his thought on this. But there's a statement coming in uh, some just a couple of minutes ago from Iyoko, uh, uh, which is dismissing some reports out there in the media. I'll read parts of it to you, and then we'll go to Samokuja to, to get his views. Who He's a member of the Council of State. His views on what's going on regarding this probe into Cecilia Dapa's case. And it says, the title of this press statement coming from the Iyoko says, referral by the special prosecutor to the economic and organized crime for investigations into money laundering against Miss Cecilia Dapa. And it has about four points here. It says, the attention of the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, has been drawn to a statement by one Samuel Apiadako, described as the Director of Strategy Research and Communications at the Office of the Special Prosecutor, OSP, widely published in the mass media to the effect that Yoko did not request the findings of the transboundary investigations, uh, that's in inverted commas and italized, conducted by the OSP and the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, and which formed uh, the basis for the suspicion of the offense of money laundering allegedly committed by Miss Cecilia Dapa. It says, in view of the intense public interest generated by the instant matter, and to correct the undue misrepresentation of facts, Ioko would like to set the record straight. Following the receipt of the referral by the OSP on 25th January 2024, Ioko, by a letter dated 1st February 2024, signed by the Deputy Executive Director Operations, Abdullahi Bashiru at Dapila, requested the Special Prosecutor for a copy of the findings on the cause on the case to facilitate Yoko's investigations. Now, Yoko goes on to say that Yoko's letter of 1st February 2024 was received at the front desk of the Office of the Special Prosecutor by a field desk officer too, Solomon Tete, who duly signed for the letter at 9.52 a.m. on 2nd February. The Deputy Executive Director of Yoko Bashiru uh, Dapila uh, followed up to the OSP and discussed with Mr. Emmanuel Basintale, the Director of Investigations of the OSP, the possibility of expediting the release of the report. This discussion was done in the presence of the Deputy Special Prosecutor, Ms. Cynthia Lamte. Mr. Basintale assured that as soon as he received clearance from the SP, the report will be released to Yoko to assist in investigations. To date, Yoko has not received any information from the OSP. The last point here, point four from this statement issued by Yoko a while ago says that Yoko deems it pertinent to indicate that it is aware of a press release issued by the OSP dated the same day that the OSP referred to the investigations to Yoko, 25th January 2024, in which the OSP stated that after, that's in quote, and italized nearly seven months of extensive investigations by the special prosecutor and a paralleled inquiry uh, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, Investigations FBI of the United States, no direct and immediate evidence of corruption has been found in the seized funds and frozen bank account linked to Miss Cecilia Dapa and her associates. So let me just correct that. It's not four points. It's actually eight points. 
and I'll read the last point, which says, Yoko uh, hereby assures the general public of its preparedness to uphold the highest investigative standard and to do right to all persons, irrespective of political, gender, race, ethnic, social, or economic status. And that is signed by the executive director of Yoko, Mamea Tiwa Adudankwa. Uh, so uh, that's the statement, like I said, coming in uh, from the economic and organized crime just a couple of minutes ago. But like I told you, uh, there are some developments as well. And Alfredo Kanse, uh, we played just a little bit of uh, that interview uh, uh, that uh, Sam Okujato granted us. I mean, you, you, you spoke to you spoke to him exclusively, and um, in fact, getting this statement from Ioko also brings up another layer uh, to the conversation. If you go on our Facebook page right now at three FM nine two seven, you'll see that statement from the Economic and Organized Crime Office right now displayed on our Facebook page, giving details of their correspondence with the Office of Special Prosecutor. Now, there's a fundamental question, you see, and, and Beatrice, we're saying that this is being reduced to a fight between Yoko and OSP, <laughs> and whereas the, the fundamental issue is being relegated. Because the issue here is, what is the source of the money of Cecilia Adapa? It certainly cannot be her salary as a Minister of Sanitation then. But instead of these two institutions paid by this taxpayer you know doing the job we're, we're seeing jobs between osp and eoco and this was the same thing with the doom so we saw jobs between gridco and, and vra and ecg well, that's not what we need right now but <laughs> there's some controversy brewing and this is what you bring to us you spoke to samo kujato let's hear from him shall we They should go and challenge it. A lawyer has actually threatened to sue. Oh, and yeah, look, the lawyer, the fact is full of so many people. There are hot heads who don't even understand the law. They will not even take the trouble to discuss with their colleagues to find out what it is. And then they join the make publicity and then you, the press, carry it. That is what the problem is. You think the AG had to advise? No, I am just telling you that when you start telling me a lawyer, that's what I'm trying to correct you and say that the law is still of so many people. Having so many people ran into the Supreme Court and they were thrown out. They are lawyers. But the question is that law is not mathematics where you just add one and two and you say that, uh, you know, this is the result. Law is a complex subject. It requires acumen. It requires knowledge. It requires ability to research. It requires ability even to converse and discuss with others. Why do we set up law chambers? We set up law chambers because we have different kind of lawyers, you understand? So when an issue arises, they put it together, they all discuss it. You may even tell you are so right, and then a younger person may just put the question, and then you realize that it is not so. The argument is why an attorney general would ask a, a, an institution that is supposed to be investigating financial crimes that don't even launch this money laundering thing into it. If the institution that is supposed to do the thing thinks that it has power beyond the attorney general, they will go ahead and do what they want to do. What does that mean? What I'm trying to tell you that each institution has its power and its limitations. That's what it can do, what it cannot do. That's what I want you to do. You don't think the AG was wrong advising Yoko not to comment I that? Have no, I am not here to go and be a judge on what the attorney general does. But you are a senior lawyer. You no, understand no, the is, law better. Make, making a senior lawyer does not make me a super natural. But, but, and also, you are forgetting something else. I'm a member of the Council of State. If there's a problem and somebody complains to me, what we we'll do is that the council will call the attorney general and ask him for an explanation on the issue. It is not for me to be in the press trying to attack the attorney general. Because the impression being created or people, the interpretation people are giving it is, it seems there is a ploy to cover up. Especially when right now there also seems to be, like I already said, Iyoko. People think that Iyoko should have even been the first institution picking it up. Why don't you want to attack Iyoko? You're you not concerned about the impression being created. AG already said, well, um, I advised Yoko not to even go ahead and launch it. And they say that OSP failed to provide the necessary information that, for instance, Yoko needed to go 
and do this money laundering investigation as it were. And people think it's kind of a sly a ploy as it were. You're not concerned. <laughs> oh, I'm not concerned. I'm just asking you. No, what are you talking about? Because you're talking this? about huge sums of money. Because the question is that if you come and you find money with me, do I owe any duty to you to experience what, what, whose money? When somebody, <laughs> nobody complained that I have stolen his money. Over a million. What if I didn't make it? Foreign currency. How many Ghanaians? Look, you Ghanaians are not honest people. The number of people here, when you go, you see all these huge buildings that they are building. No, but who asked them as to where they got the money from, when they, they started it, when it was it completed? Nobody does. So you just pick on just one individual, you want to make it as if she was just an extraordinary rogue who has stolen money. Well, you don't even have any. If you have evidence that she stole money, please make the complaint. But there's the argument they are making is that even if you don't have evidence, circumstantial evidence enough, why you have these huge sums of money? Do the law not... convict people on circumstantial evidence? They are saying Ghanaians are just. When you go to people. the criminal court, you must establish the issues beyond all reasonable doubt. That's what the criminal law says beyond all reasonable doubt. The criminal law is not based upon suspicion or mere allegation. And you just heard there, uh, Sam Okujeto. He is a member of the Council of State, uh, given his view of this Cecilia Dapa case and everything happening around it. And you're still here on Hot Edition. Welcome to Campaign Trail. Uh, let's start from President Akufado, who is encouraging all Ghanaians who have turned 18 and all who wish to vote in the December elections to come out in their numbers and register in the EC's ongoing regist uh, voter registration exercise. Speaking at a mini rally in uh, Dobro near in Sawem, after a visit to the premises of Blue Skies Limited, President Akufado said that he'll be happy to see Dr. Mahmoud Baumia elected as the president of Ghana in the December polls. The registration has started and anyone eligible to register should go and register. Your vote determines your power in Ghana. I cannot hand over to someone I've succeeded who does not appreciate whatever I do. He will come and destroy it. Only 
I am pleading with you to vote for the one I have worked with for the past seven and a half years and trust that he will continue with my good words. And you heard the uh, President Kofuadu throwing that uh, mini rally uh, near in Sawem. I'm joined by uh, political analyst uh, Dr. Jonathan Asante Otri. Good evening to you, Doc. Thank you for joining us on Hot Edition. Good evening, Beatrice, and good evening to your listeners. You have the president there uh, uh, kind of uh, reiterating, as it were, uh, that statement by Brian Echampon saying that uh, Ghanaians will vote for, uh, for the MPP, so there will be no need to hand over power to another party. I'm wondering whether you had that same sense. Pardon me? I'm wondering whether you had that same sense that we should be concerned. That... The president saying that uh, essentially uh, we are not going to hand over uh, power uh, to any yeah. other uh, political party because okay. we believe that uh, okay. Dr. Baumia is winning. All right. Thank you very much, Patricia. And let me say good evening once again to your listeners. Um, it is quite unfortunate that pronouncement as base, as, uh, as some of these are coming from people, you know, who are supposed to know better. Um, I think that an existing president who has nothing to lose, you know, should think of leaving a legacy. And that legacy should be smooth transfer of power. It is very important. So it doesn't matter who wins. But the point is that although your party is, is contesting and your favorite son is equally contesting, if you have nothing to hide, I think you shouldn't be worried about who wins the elections. If you have nothing to hide, and as an exiting president who has nothing to lose, who is not contesting, he's not part of the contest, you have nothing to lose. You shouldn't be more worried about who wins. You should rather be more worried about the fact that you are supposed to leave a legacy and have a smooth transfer of power. Whichever, whichever, in terms of either NDC or MPP, that should win. Again, he, I think that the president is a major problem for Baumia's campaign. But as of now, they wouldn't know until they have lost the elections. Because for me, he's not contesting. He's just a distraction for Dr. Baumia. You are not contesting. And you behave as though you are one. Now, by that, by that stretch of imagination, I feel that you are rather making Baumia not to be his own man. That if you are not part of the team, it's as if nobody will listen to him. The, the other point, too, is that there is an inherent illogicality in his pronouncement that this is somebody he's defeated. He doesn't, start, he doesn't think that he should be the one he should hand over to. I'm telling the president that there is an inherent illogicality in his presentation. So let me, because before you continue with your thought, let me, yeah. uh, let me just read exactly what he said. I don't want to be succeeded by the candidate I defeated, one who is never pleased with any of our achievement. He will destroy everything we have accomplished under my tenure. What's wrong with the president saying that at a campaign uh, grounds where he believes there are a lot of supporters who I I I in, in effect would be spreading that message as it were to other people to join in to vote for his no, candidate? Not only talking. In the, in the era of the media, are not only talking to those who are present. You are not there, but you have received that kind of information. So what about the majority who are not present? You are communicating a false kind of information that you are afraid of something. When you came to power, have you destroyed all the things that your predecessor did? If that is the case, then that is a fear that is entertaining. After all, there are numerous projects that he discontinued. And we, we have a list, a litany of them, that are dotted throughout the country. Now, he's forgotten that the, the main contender, his main opponent, I don't even know whether President Akufa is contender in the Mahama. The main opponent, Dr. Baumia, has put out there that, in fact, owing to the economy, the state of it, he's not going to, there and there, engage in new kind of projects to encumber the economy. 
He will rather focus on those things that are yet to be completed, complete them, and make them useful to the Ghanaian. But where I was talking about the inherent illogicality is the fact that in 2012, Mr. Mahama defeated you. In 2016, you defeated him. He did not say or suggest to us that once he, he never said in the 2016 election that he is not ready to hand over to you because he defeated you in 2012. I think that is a very voodoo logic and very unprecedented, and it shouldn't come from a president. So what were you expecting now, him to say on a campaign ground where he's trying to canvass votes for uh, candidates he wants to win? Now, the research, a research team led by a certain person tells us in a certain video on social media that, look, this election, three institutes will not win them the elections. Uh, allowance payments to the nurses and teachers will not win them the elections. There is, a, there, there is turbulence in the labor front. People have just kept quiet. Look, the economy. I mean, today, the fuel is a, a petrol. That, I buy my petrol from where? Over the years. 1522. That is close to someone's gallon. This is a letter. That is what you should be more worried about. The dollar, where the dollar has gotten to, you should be more worried about. But equally so, what the researcher told them is that they must be candid about the challenges of the economy and plead with Ghanaians, show humility. That is not what the president is saying. And you see, that in itself runs, you know, uh, at variance with the nature and characteristics of the Tabaumia. And for me, the way he's going about the campaign is virtually sidelining the Tabaumia. And don't forget, the reason why they lost Asin North is the fact that Charles Upoku was virtually not made to campaign. So it was the Akka people because they wanted to have a bragging right. And you see, in reality, the MPP is suffering from dwindling fortune. You have to bear in mind that two of your strongholds, you did not in any way have enough votes to use as a bragging right. That is the reality. Kumehu, your opponent had over 1,000 votes in addition. Now you go to Ajusu and you see an individual, how he performed. You went to Asin North, which I, I said that that was the real deal in terms of referendum on the policies of government, the effect of it. And you saw how they were trounced with all the resources and all the, uh, the, the top brass of the party that went there. So for me, you know, this submission of the president rather creates doubt in the minds of Ghanaians that the president has something to hide. Therefore, he will be comfortable to have Baumia win. Why not? We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonathan Asante, for expressing uh, your views on the comment by the president. And that's how we end Hot Edition here.